Greetings and uh, welcome to our monthly Applied Professional and Executive Coaching 101 with my co-host, uh, Coach Mishti, based in Mumbai, India, and myself, Sam Zima, based out of Johannesburg, southern tip of Africa, a country called South Africa. That's how we are known, uh, Mishti. <laughs> Very easy name to remember. What is the name of that country in the south of the African continent? It can only be South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> Connected like with you, I'm trying to figure out whether there's anything specific around uh, your province is called Mahashtra, am I right? Yes. I don't know whether geographically I can say anything I've just said about South Africa. You do that for us. And then, of course, introduce our guest, but also start by, by just giving update as to what has happened uh, prior yes. to, the, to the show today. But otherwise, I'm looking forward to another conversation with you, fellow coaches, around what we do with clients and communities out there using our coaching methodologies to help them achieve what they intend to achieve. Over to you, Mishti, and greetings from South Africa, Africa to India. Thank you so much, Sam. Greetings to you and greetings to all the wonderful viewers who are tuned in. Uh, may I start with an apology first? We were expecting uh, Viswarut Mukherjee, but uh, due to a COVID crisis, he was not able to uh, come in today. Uh, he's and uh, he's managing some crisis at work and in his personal space. So that has been a challenge. So uh, we have been uh, ready for crisis. Uh, we've, yeah. It's become a resilient experience here in India because uh, some some situation or the other keeps coming in. But uh, heartfelt apologies. And uh, on that note, I still promise you that we'll have a very interesting discussion today because we have a wonderful coach, a very experienced coach and leadership facilitator with us who will be sharing insights on coaching and also working with emerging markets. And before we go on to that, um, with your permission, may I introduce myself? My yes, name sure. is <laughs> my name is Mishti Verma. I am a coach, a facilitator and a gender sensitization expert. I work with a consulting company called OD Alternatives as a partner. ODA has partnered with over 300 organizations in their transformation journey, leadership development, and talent development. And we also have certifications in organization development and diversity and inclusion with the Tata Institute of Social Sciences. So uh, again, looking forward to a very interesting conversation today. And with great pleasure, may I introduce our guest today. Our guest is Coach Rahul Shah, a very experienced leadership facilitator and an HR professional with over 22 years of experience. He's worked with many countries, many populations. He's worked in France. He's worked with Cambodia, Singapore, Vietnam, and he's coached different kinds of populations. Uh, besides that, his passion is to really mentor and coach the youth to uh, catch him young and bring out uh, their best potential. So uh, that is the brief introduction of Rahul Shah, but it doesn't do justice to his journey. So we are going to understand more from him. Okay, yes. so over to Sam and then we'll take it. Yeah, uh, what a pleasure. Thank you very much, Coach Raul, for availing yourself at the last notice. And I always say that as coaches, we, we go into our coaching sessions ready to hear what our uh, conversation partners, being our coaching clients, bring to the table. So I'm sure this was not a shock to your system. Am I right? No, not at all. When I heard this is more of a conversation, and you're very open to having uh, you know these kind of conversations, so so I, I was very excited and happy and honored to uh, be part of this conversation and uh, see how I can be valued to the to the all the viewers who are watching us across the world. 
Beautiful, beautiful. You know, uh, uh, in my in my previous work, I engaged a lot with emerging countries. But when I look at the list of countries that you worked in, I said, "Wow, I have never had the opportunity to work with these emerging markets: Vietnam, Philippines, Cambodia, well, Dubai. We all know Dubai, Sri Lanka, Fra and then of course France. That must be." an immense experience in terms of diversity of cultures. Maybe let's do give you the opportunity just to take us through your, your, your journey to, to hear. And I know it's a big ask, but we certainly want to hear what, what insights you bring from such diverse countries as a coach and what can we learn from, from your experiences? Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, sharing that. And as I'm talking to you, you know, it's a, it's a privilege when you get opportunity to work um, across the globe. Uh, and I'm sure last uh, one and a half years, people would have seen that it's much easier to reach out when you're looking at uh, uh, doing all this online. But And as I'm talking to you, I'm working with uh, Porta Villa. Uh, I'm working uh, I'm currently with one of the clients in Africa, uh, Durban, East Africa. So so it's it's interesting to see uh, that it is diverse, Sam and Misty, and mm -hmm. what energizes me, you know, when, when you initially go for having cross-cultural interactions, especially across the world and in, uh, in these countries, you have a immediate worry that will you be able to connect with their culture, their mindset, their ways of working, their own challenges, right? So, so that that concerns, um, it just gets collapsed after a few minutes of rapport building initial mm. conversation, because we often forget that ultimately all of us are human. You know, the mm. emotion mm. is mm. similar. Mm. You know, we, we, we laugh, we cry, we, we happy, we lose our patience, we get excited. Yeah. So if you really notice, those are very similar across the world, across country, across culture. Mm. And that, that is what resonates uh, when you're having these discussions. You know, you, you have that worry and it, it sounds very good that, oh, the person has such diverse experience. But, you know, if I look at, uh, it's very humbling when you, when you meet people in close quarters and accept the way they speak English, and the, the mannerism, everything else is fairly similar because yeah. you will find that emotional connect. That's the ground mm. zero where all of us relate with each other. Mm. Mm. Wonderful. And that has been very easy for me when, when you go down to that part, then it, that diversity, uh, the, uh, the aura of that diversity just collapses and you feel, you feel connected immediately. Mm. And I think I've used how that you, as an advantage. How did you, how did you prepare yourself for 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 these assignments, uh, 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 Raul? Um, or did you just go open minded and then learn as you going along? How did that happen? Yeah. Yeah. So if I if I connect that to recent experience, you know, I was I was speaking to uh, four different culture as I mentioned to you recently, just couple of months back, uh, you know, very four different uh, country and four different culture. So when you look at that, when you approach the uh, conversation, I think what number one is uh, you try to understand the context, the, the country context, you know, what's the mm. country, because when you're coaching executives, because these are senior executives, which I'm, I'm having a conversation. So uh, there is a role context, there is a culture context, there is an environmental context, and there is an individual context. So mm. you, you really have to study from those lenses. So if we look at the individual context, you know, we, we use, uh, I have often used the personality data as one data point, which helps you to understand, you know, what are the characteristics of the individual who you're going to talk to? 
yeah. then you dive deeper into their uh, role context you know are you speaking to sales person are you speaking to a marketing person are you speaking to a finance person are you speaking to an hr person so you understand what kind of dynamics the individual will be surrounded by yeah so you go with that clarity when you are approaching these dialogue the third is of course the org context which is what's the organization which you are working with and what is their uh, culture like and the country context because mm. because these leaders uh, are playing with the um, uh, in the political environment they are working along with the governments they are working along with uh, the the uh, uh, you know the employees in that region so if you understand that then you are able to relate with their challenges you know the importance for a coach is how can you relate with your challenge and, and sam and mr i'm sure you'll agree with me that today there are varied uh, style of coaching you know one of the uh, coaching style is a uh, discovery led coaching where you allow the uh, the person to discover himself or herself through through conversation uh, but mm. the other side the other school of thought is how do you make it challenging as well because it just cannot be discovery led you have to ask difficult question you have to create a rapport in such a manner that you are able the person is able to see himself or herself uh, in where the coach is challenging him or her and very mm. often we as in our role we become very uh, and i would say i i used to i i used to become very easy going coach rather than yeah. you know showing the mirror or really putting the person at a uh, difficult crossroads by making him or her feel that mm. he is not facing himself he is he is running mm. away from his own uh, uh, challenges so i think that challenging conversation also become very important and that becomes easier when you understand you can empathize with their world when you understand the role context the org context the culture context and also a lot of times these informations are not available uh, handily so you yes, have some yes. kind of a prep which you need I, to I, I, I want that all the thing that is the point i wanted to get to of the three of the four context i'm very interested in the country context because i'm sure there is no one standard formula that you can apply to yeah. each of the countries because countries are at different levels hence the idea of the emerging markets is, it, 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 it make me very excited because you are saying that uh, you could get a coach coming from the most developed countries going into these countries wanting to coach executives there and and probably coming with the no with the thinking that i know it all i've seen it all i've coached all the executives all over the world uh, then you come into a country where you're going to be struggling with the basics of the basics and it is nothing wrong nothing judgmental about the countries it is just what it is and that for me is what makes me i'm very interested because i still haven't come across a coaching program just for emerging markets but 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 i think in coaching we talk about context so the emerging market is a context and i want you to share with us as a coach and you are guiding other coaches around the country context over and above just culture and diversity what are the yeah. things that when you are going to cambodia and you're going to all these countries where the things that coming up and they stayed with you and you figure are valuable for anyone who wants to coach in those contexts. Yes. Just yeah. to add to what Sam was saying, that um, every context in terms of country is diverse. It's it's also mm. rich, but it's also challenging because every every country will have its own etiquettes. And so even while you're talking about the country context and how does one coach in the emerging markets, is there uh, something as coach uh, as a coach you would also follow in terms of etiquettes you know do, are you mindful of the etiquettes as well do you study the mm. etiquettes as well and mm. keep that in mind while coaching because people may be sensitive to certain etiquettes uh, when it comes to the country context so if you could you know also share some views on that sure absolutely and uh, thank you uh, mr and uh, sam to share that uh, so i would say it's you know at this forefront it's it's these are hindsight insight uh, if i may call that out yeah. when you're going into it 
these uh, you may not be like perfect when you're getting into the conversations as such so for example i was doing a conversation for dubai market uh, last 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 year uh, if almost 15 12 months 15 months back and parallelly i had an assignment uh, in another market so so dubai as a market is very different because it's a melting pot from a culture standpoint right mm-hmm. and some of these informations is fairly available because you know mm-hmm. that that market is very different and it is not um, and there are issues when you go into the conversation their issues are very different because they have mm-hmm. challenges of trust you would not trust mm-hmm. with each other very quickly because you're looking at individuals as countries mm-hmm. you know, you're looking at individual you're not saying misty you're saying misty india sam mm-hmm. south yeah. africa you're making those kind of conversation so if you understand that you know what's the uh, uh what's the underlying tone when you're having a conversation with with individuals in that market right and uh, parallelly like if i go to i remember i went to philippines and very limited idea on how the culture is and very concerned how will i be accept, accepted what's that i only knew philippines as a friendly culture yeah so it is a, it's a country which is very friendly uh, warm and people will be a very um, inclusive so with that thought i had gone but what really helped me is uh, whenever you go like when when i used to travel now you know traveling for last two years but when i went travel i would be friend with everyone like i would go to the hotel i will be friend with that individual to understand what that culture is what are the things what is the uh, terminologies you would use to really create mm. that rapport and have conversations and to my mm. advantage like philippines was interesting because i had a friend who had another friend who was a actor she was an actor local actor in philippines and mm. she connected me to her so the first thing i did before my conversations i had like a leadership workshop and uh, so just two days before that i made sure i had a conversation i met her and to my advantage she was a known celebrity so i clicked my snaps with her and yeah. uh, and i clicked snaps with all the locals whenever i used to go to the market with the hotel people and my first 15 minutes of my conversation was just showing the participants how i believe philippines is a friendly country and i said here is a stranger who entered two days back and look at the collage of photographs in front of you i met the actor i met the taxi guy i met the hotel chef and look at how you treated me wow oh. so so will you say that will you say, there's this saying that uh, the the before you even become a coach there is a coaching way of being in terms of your personality so you will say will you say that it is important for one to be interested in the in the country that is going into starting from the airport when you are picked up by the taxi you need to start the conversation there <laughs> that yeah. gives you insights into the Absolutely. country Absolutely like that and it's so beautiful if you do that like singapore when i when you when i traveled in the um, uh, with the taxi guy he was so friendly and i asked him you know i'm surprised the way you are you're so friendly and so warm he said you know what the first thing we are trained when we become a taxi driver by the government is you are the ambassador of singapore because every stranger who will meet you yeah. will be the yeah. first, you will be the first person will be met by the expats yeah. and the way you behave will be the impression the individual will have of the country so you are yeah. the ambassador of singapore so yeah. you can imagine the purpose statement which was made to the uh, driver when he was getting yes. trained uh as an ambassador of yes. the country yeah. welcoming all people who are so diverse but coaches are very special people uh, uh, coaches and hr in fact all the helping professions professionals are very special helping people who are not necessarily maybe having the same insights with us now you come there you will do all those sort of things you have this executive who's in he might be an expatriate or he might just be a local needing your services as an international coach to help them deal with the dynamics of their environment now you 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 know that some of the difficulties 
these executives are faced with, they are created by themselves because of uh, 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 not being aware, unconscious incompetence. So now you're coming in and you unlock there and you want to bring them to the level where you are, where they can appreciate everybody. Where do you start? I mean, I know you don't want to create an agenda for the for the client you are going to be coaching, but you want to start a conversation that will actually take you to the next level. Now you are yeah. Coach Raul, you are right, you've got this client sent to you by head office to help this client in an emerging market or the other way around. Now, take what us is through the starting the point? What yeah. is the starting yeah, point? And also uh, another thing that I wanted to add, you know, you shared some very interesting insights in terms of, you know, connecting with the celebrities. So you're creating common points of connect. So in yeah. India, they say, you know, if you want to build repo, you talk about Bollywood, you talk about cricket, you talk about politics. <laughs> so um, in different countries, do you follow different styles and uh, some, some, you know, a universal way of figuring out what are the highlights of conversations, especially walking into a, a workshop setting and uh, trying to use those uh, conversation points to build the rapport and uh, start the journey? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, that's very important. Like you see, you you your earlier question on you know how what are the do's and don'ts when you're looking at the culture and when you're having those initial dialogue, uh, how are you able to make sure that uh, you are uh, someone who's neutral. And mm -hmm. Sam, to your point, that the importance of uh, you are not coming across someone who's been sent by headquarters to uh, change you. You know that impression. And you can figure that out within 10 minutes of conversation. You can figure that out that the person is feeling that everything which he or she will speak is getting recorded in, in the uh, coach's mind. And you will see that the individual will put, put walls and that's not a fruitful conversation for a coach. Yeah. Mm. And I'm sure we, we learn in our coaching lessons and it's very difficult that empathy piece it's not easy. We know, we understand, but really demonstrating that empathy that I can understand your pain and I can see where you're coming from. I think that differentiates between a good coach and the best coach. You know, how you're able to articulate that and show that you're vulnerable. So I think the first half an hour, Sam uh, and Misty would be very important uh, when you're having this dialogue where you're neutralizing that I'm interested in you and your journey mm -hmm. and your challenges. So I often don't interrupt cross question in the first 20, 25 minutes of the discussion. You know, I, uh, for me, uh, if I, if I look at my style of coaching, I am very context coach, which means I spend a lot of time in understanding the individual's context from the individual themselves, because that mm -hmm. becomes very important so that he, he or she feels that the coach doesn't have an ulterior motive. He is, his understanding me bases how I'm painting myself to him and my environment. He's not come prepared with his own pre-assumptions about my world. Mm -hmm. So if I have established that kind of connect with him in the first 15, 20 minutes or half an hour that you know, I don't have any background of who you are, I am understanding you basis you make me understand who you are and i trust you completely on that and if i've established that and i've seen nine out of ten times then the individual the coach has an advantage that the person feels that heard you were heard by someone because the advantage coaches has irrespective is that the person will listen and very rarely you get that time to pause because senior executives don't get time to talk aloud they don't speak to their spouse. The managers don't have time to have so much conversation where they'll give 90 minutes, one and a half hour to just share their perspective. They're always in the run. So this pause yeah. moment is very well appreciated unless there is no value in that conversation. So in the first half and half, of course, they'll appreciate that the person is hear you. And then once you uh, move into the second segment where the individual starts seeing the value, he or she starts seeing how I am, uh, uh, I am my own challenge and I have created stories in my own head about people, situations, issues, 
and I have to change. I think those uh, value adds, if you don't provide that in the later half of the conversation, the conversation is not meaningful. But just to quickly answer your question, I would say that first 20, 25 minutes of rapport building and empathy, connecting to the empathy in the true sense becomes the most powerful way to uh, show that you're not someone who's come from headquarters to just put something to uh, rest, but you're here to help. There's a lot of neutrality. Yeah. Yes. So there's a lot of neutrality in the first 20 yes. minutes of the conversation. And I hear that you talk about a lot of observation as well. So I, what I hear you say is that you really need to observe the dynamics in the first 20 minutes. You need to observe the context a lot. So can you just tell us a little more about observation and how important that is in the entire coaching journey? Sure. No, I think that's that's very, very critical because you'll, you'll realize like uh, just last month, I'm remembering of one conversation where this individual was just not opening up. It was seeming as if he, because every time he used to uh, share an issue, he used to paint it in a manner that how that issue is not created by me. And he's trying to position himself that if you're trying to understand me, I'm not the issue here. See, this guy is an issue or this, this situation is an issue or the culture is an issue. I'm not the issue. So then you're, you're understanding that the person is not opening up. He is not, not, and I know from the personality context when I, and sometimes these report helps because I know this person is someone who has, uh, who doesn't trust easily. He's highly skeptic as a person. Yeah. You know, you know that because you know the personality context when you've seen the report. So if you've seen the report, you're not surprised that the individual is also painting. So you are nudging to see if the person opens up. He said, then you're trying to trying to cross question. If you've seen that pattern, Misty, in the first 15 minutes of the conversation, the questions I would ask is, how is it uh, back at other places? You know, let's take off work. Let's look at home. Let's look at uh, extracurricular activities, which you do. So like this one leader, who realized that he has a huge emotional outburst, which he relaxed a lot. So he, he never felt that he had emotional outburst. He said, I have really worked hard on the emotional outburst. Field. But when I, when I asked him some questions on the extracurricular activity, he said, when I play cricket, mm -hmm. I have the huge emotional outburst. And I, I, when, I'm, I'm, when I'm winning or losing a game, and then he could connect that how that emotional outburst has not completely gone out of him. It's just that the setting has changed. In corporate setting, he has suppressed it. But in non-corporate setting, he's still expressing it. So somewhere he was defending that he has changed, but actually he has not changed. He's actually suppressed these two emotions. So you have to keep watching the, the choice of words, mm -hmm. the the way they are and what's the pattern of the conversation because in the start the person would have said so therefore in, uh, i would say a coach is a master integrator when i use the word master integrator what the person has said in the first 10 minutes and what the person yeah. is saying at the 45th minute can you integrate and quickly create a pattern and see and then you concretize it you you are not yeah. judging the person you're concretizing yeah. by cross question because that yeah. is the uh, art of a coach that he or she is non-judgmental, but he checks for concreteness. Is there a concreteness to my hypothesis or it's just the hypothesis which is which is not correct in this current situation? So I think that takes I, a lot of energy because you're listening and you're making those hypotheses. And that is the mastery of a coach is I would I would call out. Um, let's 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 look at this scenario. The, the executives will often finance the, the coaching programs to assist other executives in whatever locations they are. Sending you as a dependable coach that they've experienced uh, working with you. But I often find that in many cases, they will be very much interested in the performance uh, coaching, even though they don't say that. They will say, listen, we have a, this executive out there that needs help. And we wonder what the issues are, but we want you to help. At the back of their mind, they say to help him so that he can deliver the results we are looking forward to. 
Now, when you arrive in the in the in in, in the session with the client, and you speak to the client using the conversational coaching approach, context approach, and then you find that the issues are lying very much squarely in the individual context, and not nowhere else. But this is never get discussed because in the company we don't discuss personal issues. Now you are stuck between the rock and the in, in the face. You know what? What do you do? You can't prescribe. You can't. Uh, you can't, uh, uh, you have a three party relationship contract. And the three, the, 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 the sponsor side is very strong because that's why they called you. This one, you have to dig it out to say, my friend, I think you need help. And, 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 and what do you do as a coach, especially in cultures where people don't open up? Wonderful. <laughs> That's a good question, uh, Sam. And I think as a coach, and I'm sure people who are listening, and I'm sure you and Misty would have also gone through this, is it puts you into a um, into a spot. And it often in situ- it, it happens in situations where you see the coaching contract is loosely created. Mm-hmm. Because you would you realize like a lot of times you've seen, I've seen experiences where the manager and the team member is not talking. And the manager mm-hmm. is feeling that uh, if I speak to him, it will be difficult and it will impact whatever performance I'm getting. But this guy is not moving to the next level, but I cannot have a conflicting conversation. And I can see that. So what the manager will do is he, he will run to the HR and say, can we, can we find an executive coach? And the HR will reach out and say, okay, we need a coach for this person. And, and the question really then is, how, what role managers play? Because the coach cannot play the manager's role. Mm-hmm. Where if the manager wants the performance, I mean, coach cannot ask for performance on behalf of the manager. You have to be very careful of what you can do and what you cannot do. Because there is a sponsor, there is a, uh, uh, there is a manager, and there is a coach. Mm. And if you, don't, if you don't contract that very well, what's the goals of it? And of course, there is a, a coachy himself. So I would say there are, if you triangulate, uh, would you talk, and if you don't contract it, uh, Sam, it becomes challenging. And uh, I wouldn't, I, I would say 50% of conversations are non-contracted where there is no clarity. The point which you mentioned, because when you dig deeper, you realize that there's a deep issue the individual has, the organization not giving him raise. He is getting tremendous offers outside and organization looking at potential, pushing him to the next level of executive but he's not getting that role, which he's asking and demanding all through. So what are you talking? Because your coaching stops there because they, there's clarity. There is clear what the individual wants, but the organization not giving. But he's saying that, okay, make him change. It will not happen. So you have to go back to the drawing board and have conversation with the sponsor, have a conversation with the coach, because sometimes coach has to stick their neck out and say, this is beyond us. I cannot what I am hearing and what has been communicated, I think this is not part of the scope. And I don't think so. I have a role in this. Very often, mm. a coach gets uh, defeated because the sponsor has hired him. So he has to play that agenda of managing or communicating what the sponsor is asking him to do. And yeah. at the same time, to build a rapport with the individual so that the individual becomes vulnerable and he opens up his pain and you realize if you empathize with him, his pain is really true. And there is a issue between the sponsor and the manager, which he has to. So very often, like in one of the conversations, specific example is where I would encourage the coachy to have that dialogue because there are certain uh, rules of contract where you cannot speak everything what the coach is telling you to the sponsor and the coach so you have to be careful you have to be abided by that terms also you cannot breach the confidentiality at the same time give thematic message but can you encourage the coachy and inspire him or her to have a direct dialogue make him prepared to have a dialogue with the sponsor and the manager and have a courageous conversation so i think that it's very case to case sam But the point is the coach has to stick the neck out sometimes because they are under immense pressure and somebody is using their shoulders to shoot. I am sorry to say and use that word, but it happens in the real world 
where you are and the moment you realize that's happening i think it's important to call that out and share what is possible and what is not possible and and at the same time i understand the coaches uh, the coachy fraternity which is hearing they say hey uh, easier said than done you know mm. you will laugh mm. at the statement mm. i i i often say that uh, 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 something that puts us executive coaches in trouble is that they these people are under pressure to deliver life saving results <laughs> if i may yeah. use that and uh, and you see it through them that they are stressed they so so i i do i do believe that uh, it's a very serious space but it is what you i hear you saying is the delivery of the results is not that direct it's not like you're working on something and when done the results come in you work on the complexities as you have mentioned those contexts and 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 when those things are addressed and the individual's challenges are addressed individuals should be able to actually do what is hired to do because they have qualifications they have experience they have expertise that's why they are on the job so these are the noises that are caused by the context that you want to uh, make them aware conscientize their sponsors that i don't necessarily work on the performance plan of this person I work on the things that will enable this person to deliver what he agreed with you, and that sometimes is not immediately evident. It requires patience that people move from the current state of being, and slowly, after a while, you produce a star. In other words, I have a feeling that in the contracting as coaches, we need to bring this across, and actually, the way we contract, we need to negotiate. For this valuable asset called time, the fact that I'm taking you through 12 months it doesn't mean that at the end of the 12 months coaching session I have delivered. Maybe it's another 12 months before you see the impact of my coaching. Or earlier, Sam. For all you know, it could be earlier as well. Absolutely. I have finished by eighth month, and I I don't be required. I you know uh, my courage is to say that hey, I think no more. My need is there in this in the eighth month, though the contract is 12 months. So, so or perhaps there is could be like... another issue that emerge, and then if they feel you still the right coach to do that, then they can Absolutely. recontract you. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. So, so the journey is is a little fluid in that sense, and it's not that specific to an ROI. Here, it's uh, about uh, constantly clarifying the expectations and uh, coming together to agree on what the deliverables are. So I Absolutely. feel. I, I feel at every point you are constantly clarifying expectations, and what you've been talking about, Rahul, sounds like a very strong balancing act between the stakeholders and uh, uh, the individuals that are being coached. So, uh, yeah, just just any, couple of weeks back, Misty, one of the example comes from mine. Is couple of weeks back, I was having this conversation with uh, a a new manager who's got transitioned uh, into a new role. He was mm -hmm. now a sub region head. which means mm. uh, east africa middle east uh, uh africa region so everything is coming under him and and we had a individual development plan discussion and uh, as a part of a check in it's important to get in the manager also so we established the contract identified what the areas from a development lens and we said okay let's go to the manager and have a conversation with the manager what he thinks should be mm. these priority areas and he had a conversation with the manager and the manager took over the entire conversation and he went into a various dimension and i could see the coachy literally freezed you know he just couldn't speak in front of the manager not defend why he has picked up some of these and i was quite surprised you know i was i was i was trying to paint why he has and i was trying to coax him hey you know what we we discuss that decision making is a strength of yours why didn't you tell that this is one of the reason why we have picked up this so he was doing it very at a very shallow level he didn't come across as very strong and immediately after that conversation i had a half an hour discussion and i realized that he had a huge fear with with the stakeholder imagine if you are immediate manager who's of course and he is not able to have a con so i like sam what you said a new need emerge out of a contract where how he has to have handle his conversation with the manager and feel comfortable to push back 
and these are new insights which comes in when you do this checking conversation uh yeah. misty so that yeah. you are not too broad because then you're getting to specific and you're giving specific help sometimes it could be beyond scope as well absolutely mm-hmm. and rahul another thing that you just mentioned about how this uh, individual really froze you know with fear so um, in my experience as a coach and you know when we do a lot of sessions for organizations i realize whenever you're taking feedback from employees uh, employees are very hesitant to talk or share because they feel that you know that feedback will go to the management or go to their managers and then they'll get into trouble for lack of a better word so uh, how do you you know solve that problem for them and uh, help them open up and you know give them that trust that it it is okay to share because you're here to solve the bigger problem uh, so that is a challenge that i have come across a lot so what are your insights on that sure and i i, I don't know i'm going to uh, use this uh, we, i often use some some of these um, uh, techniques one of the technique is uh, misty you would know it's called psychodrama yeah. uh, sam i'm not sure yeah. if you're aware yeah. of that yeah uh, mm-hmm. which is a beautiful technique where you know one of the things which a coach role is to build coach's muscle and the muscle of the coach cannot come in by just having conversation you have to role model it or role play for him mm. right so so i often do that role play activity where i will ask him that like an empty chair kind of an exercise you yes. can do that okay imagine if this person is your manager how would you have yeah. the conversation yeah. now the person sees it i will do it this way but when he embodies that actually mm. doing it it's a very different and it's a safe environment because he is doing or he or she is doing in the presence of a coach so yeah. whatever change he has to make he he or she is making in that safe environment so that often becomes a great tool when you use these tools uh, as yeah. not just i, I love i thing. love the i love the empty yeah. chair uh, 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 absolutely yeah. it's, a, it's a very famous one and and i'm glad you bring in this because this show is really intended at the uh, practicing coaches of course even the people who buy coaching from us so that they can understand the how we work and i'm glad you bring this and i wanted to ask you to say Uh, do you find value in us as coaches reflecting on or back onto ourselves how we actually handle the clients because you have just given me a good example of how we deliver value to the clients and 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 how often do we really critically look at the coaching methodologies we use or we just allow clients to get used to our patterns our way of doing and then we go on run them through all the sessions and and i think that for me is another conversation and and you 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 just made a good example of how do you build the muscles of the of the coachee that's one way uh, mish has asked how do you create a safe space for the employees to talk about their company without fearing that the coach will actually divulge what was discussed to the sponsors i also raised the question of say uh the conflict between the sponsor's expectations and those of the coach and the coachee how do we manage those because those are dynamics that actually can affect the value of your coaching delivery that's Let's wonderful talk coaches. Let's talk to coaches <laughs> that's wonderful in fact you know um uh, i would call it telepathy because i was when he was talking about psychodrama and i'm also trained in psychodrama so you know we had an exchange of smiles <laughs> on that conversation <laughs> so uh um, in psychodrama uh, initially it's also about understanding what role do you bring to the group so uh, there is a concept about what role do you bring so in tapping into your own roles your own strengths is uh, quite essential so i would like to talk about two uh, concepts which sam you also spoke about one is about creating safe space uh, which is so critical in facilitation in counseling and in coaching and also in techniques of psychodrama if rahul you can just share a little bit about that and also you know from the psychodramatic perspective how do you strengthen that role for uh, besides the mt chair you know do you also dabble on what that role 
is in terms of uh, how the coach can approach the manager and how do you strengthen the role essentially from a psychodrama perspective is a part of yourself that needs to be strengthened and addressed so what any any technique that you do to strengthen that aspect of the personality or that role of the personality that builds that kind of courage or muscle to address these issues and challenges so i think uh, uh, mr i think it it's just that um i would say it's about doing it and then making them reflect and i i don't know um uh, in 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 the current i mean sometimes it's possible where the coach the coach is actually going in the setting of uh, like some of the executive coaches actually go for board meetings along with their coachy when you are going into the life scenario so that you are auditing how the individual is doing and what the individual is doing uh, there are uh, several settings which allows you to do that and that's an that's an awesome way i i forget the name what's called it's called live play uh, i'm i'm not sure the name is live play or something like that or which is uh, called as so that's another way of doing it where you actually preparing the person and then going live in the in the setting and seeing it yourself as a coach and seeing mm. what was possible and what was not possible as an individual so i think it's a muscle which is cannot be developed overnight it's your constantly at it and seeing and then reflecting on saying oh, what worked what didn't work what needs to change now uh, what are the different uh, conversations you need to do to shift that i think that's a that's a dialogue which you're having more consistently but if you're embodying it in some form if you are playing it out i think it becomes much easier than uh, i would say just talking aloud around it so yeah, i have i, I, I guess have we that, yeah. i guess just sort of interjecting i guess we all as coaches suffer from the the lack of insights in real life situations for our clients we trust that they tell us the mm -hmm. stories whatever they tell us is we can mm -hmm. work on so what if they're not telling us the truth or they're not telling you the full story so there's always an element of we can't take the responsibility to full extent for the for the behavior of our clients in a real situation and if we are invited into that real situation they might just be acting on that day yeah and again and, you still and, don't get it. yeah and i think uh, <laughs> that, for that i would i would say that Uh, you know as a coach the other thing i would also call out for all the coaches who are listening eh, as a fraternity is do you can you be a coachy because if you're not a coachy it's very difficult to connect and re realize what happens so you know i am a coach but i'm also a coachy which means i'm also undergoing uh, coaching conversations and one of the insight which came in is uh, while i was going through a coaching conversation that i was trying to be a pleaser to the coach so i was doing things to please him or to gain impression or have oh. a good impression and that yeah. was a strong insight because then i could realize if i as a coachy is impressing my coach which means suddenly the rapport has gone off i'm not vulnerable i am just saying things which is likable i am not being myself mm. and the same is true when the coachy is having a conversation with you so is the aura of coach is such that the coachy is become likable uh, because he's trying mm. to show that i should be likable in coach coach i then you have lost the game because then yeah. you are seeing that the person is saying things to gain that impression not being what you are and yeah. that's a very thin line to observe and quickly get off that because the moment you realize it uh because you'll see yeah. the rapport is not strong then you are still uh the individual is not not fully there you're not uh the coachy is not fully with you i i uh, i have a, i have a practical example where with this particular executive in the earlier stages of our coaching relationship it was very difficult to use what we call challenging coaching where you tell it like it is because they were very sensitive you know to being told the truth and and I must tell you I worked on that for quite a very very long time and at some point I thought it we were not going to crack it but I must tell you look 
the beauty of where we are now is like, it's like then she was you say, but so it means that some of the things that we were doing was not really coaching. I said, you know, I was pushed into a situation where I just failed to apply the true coaching approach to you because you were not receptive and the relationship wasn't established enough for me to tell it like it is. But I'm very glad that through supervision. So mm. I got to a point where I realized that I'm failing myself, actually. Mm. Because if you're staying in this relationship and you are not telling this executive the wrongs that they are doing, you are not helping them and they're not getting value for money. So yeah. the message for me to us as fellow coaches is that sometimes it's going to take a very long time, especially when you're working at the, at the top end of the leadership, to build the rapport that you require to be able to tell it like it is. But when you get to that point, I tell you, they will, they will, they will see return on investment in an amazing way. So that's just my own experience, uh, because we do feel vulnerable as coaches too, sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think just to that point, uh, you you realize that uh, we take ourselves sometimes very seriously, because uh, you know I I have like I had an advantage of um, in one of the organization for coachy same organization, different levels, uh, I mean, same levels and four departments. And I could see that all the four has taken very different part from me. You know, mm. one coach, one coachy was so non-actionable and the fourth coachy was so action oriented and he used to do whatever he committed uh, to uh, do. And, and I stepped back and thought that, you know, to get the best out of the coach is also coachy's responsibility. As a coach, mm -hmm. I have to do my best, but the coach's responsibility is to get the best out of the coach. And mm -hmm. if he or she is not doing it, it's a disservice which he or she is doing for himself. Yeah. It's yeah. wonderful. It's a partnership. Fact, it's, it's a, a partnership. partnership. Yes. 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 Yeah. In fact, uh, there they, is. We often. Sorry, Mr. Shifo. Sorry, yes. I'm talking over no, you. So, we, uh, often, yeah. we, we often yeah. wait too long. To over to emphasize that this is a partnership, and, and, and therefore the success of it depends on all of us, not only the coach. Yes. Yes. Sorry, yeah. Mr. Yeah. yes. So, so the contracting is not only with uh, the management. The contracting is a lot with the coachee as well, in terms yeah. of clarifying mm -hmm. the trust, the expectations, and what uh, overall the norms are expected. So. Um, yeah. So uh, also, you know, uh, we were talking about uh, what you were saying uh, that, you know, you were working with these four different coaches and one was not at all responsive. So I, I remembered a saying that uh, in coaching, it is that not everyone can be coached. Mm. And you have to realize that at some point that uh, this person is not ready or you may not be the right coach for that person because you know uh, everyone is looking for a different style at times and when you said that you know as coaches we should not take ourselves so seriously that you know it is something it's a task that needs to be delivered so uh, how comfortable are you with the idea that there could be a coachy that may not uh, want the coaching that you're offering and and the fact that not everyone can be coached and how do you deal with that yeah and i think it's uh, there's a saying which comes to my head is uh, when the student is ready teacher arrives <laughs> Isn't it? That, that's true and and you cannot wait for the student to be ready also <laughs> at the same time right you have to get the deliverables uh, as sam you were sharing sharing uh, up front uh, so uh, so yeah so it's important for the um, for the coach to to share and i think this is where the challenging coaches feedback comes in very often we don't give feedback to the coachy that hey you know you cancelled last meeting you coming late for three meetings you've come 15 minutes 20 minutes late and uh, everything what we discussed uh it seems you have uh, forgotten or you were not able to work on it because there was too much pressure back at the workplace yeah so so I'm finding, you know, I would, I would, I would say muster the courage, you know, I'm finding, I am, I want to recheck what's the value we are deriving out of this conversation. You know, what value are you feeling? Uh, mm -hmm. It's important that you're investing your time and effort and energy and I'm investing my time and energy. And are we accruing the value which you want 
or we should relook at this delay the engagement defer this for some few weeks and get things ready i mean really having that open dialogue uh, mm. is very very critical and if we don't do that you're suffering internally and i i feel there's a integrity issue in my heart and mind because i'm getting paid for nothing and i may mm. not enjoy that yeah. i'm getting paid mm. uh, it's a great mm. thing to have you're just doing nothing but you're doing this service for everyone yeah i find that to be the most difficult thing for the coaches um yeah. and i think it's a quality that we need to acquire and the training that perhaps we need to undergo because sometimes we like you're saying um things happen that are not right and they need to be addressed and and i always say that sometimes we overplay this saying that said try to not in, be involved into logistical aspects of your coaching program and whatnot. and that's why we employ a, a coaching assistants or administrators and often we say please can you just tell that client that uh, they must stick to the time please so they must come yeah. late. And, and i what i hear you saying is that actually we should it is part of our deliverables that we give them feedback on the behaviors that they might be doing somewhere else that they are doing to you yeah and the importance is behavior so it's factual you're not like oh i feel mm. i think yeah. you know you're, you're talking concrete by giving examples of what has happened yeah so uh, rahul i hear you use the word concrete a lot you know in our conversation today that it is important for you to concretize uh, yeah. the conversations the feelings the the behaviors so um i would want to you know before we go on to uh, concluding the conversation i want to hear a little bit about coach rahul what concretizes the whole experiences that coach rahul has had what are his strengths what are his qualities and why concretizing is something that's so important for you sure so if i if i just take you through the journey of how i have reached there i have reached i think uh, i don't know it'd be interesting for others to know but i i'm not come come from diverse background so so very very often when you graduate uh, you you need clarity you know what you want to do and likewise uh, i also wanted that clarity what i wanted to do and i had no idea and i'm sure all of us will agree that very often it's so clouded so i realized i should strike off what i don't want to do rather than what i want to do because i said i ultimately i'll hit what i want to do but what i don't want to do so i dabbled in my careers initial years in sales and uh, uh, and then i uh, moved into event management and i realized very soon within 3 to 4 years that these are the things which i don't want to do and um, and i used to be a sales trainer a lot i used to go on the forefront and talk how sales should happen how and that's when i realized there's a spark in the dark tunnel that maybe this is what i want to do and when i realized what i want to do in 6 years in my in my uh, post graduation career nobody was giving you a job because when you know what you want to do it's become more difficult things go away and i thought okay i want to be a good trainer and i used to not, i never got a job and i was like getting frustrated i said what do i do so i i realized i need to design my career so i did that i picked up my um, management uh, course from a reputed institute in india called nasimon ji i did my mba from there and then uh, i realized i need to have teaching experience so i approached my management college can i teach and to my fortune uh, they gave me assignments to teach at undergraduates and that was a good formative experience for me what it takes to actually stand up and deliver programs in front of students or a class and i did that Wonderful. for 3 years do you mind do you mind just holding it there this is yeah. very interesting yeah. i hope you have few minutes still gotcha. remaining when we come back to talk exactly on these issues and thanks for that question mishti when we come back we will we will spend few minutes we won't hold you that long we we'll spend few minutes and uh, talking around this because this is fundamental if you don't mind we'll be back 